The next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, who's here in person, has been described as a leading world authority on cancer. He was the founder of Cancer Partners UK and professor and chairman of the Department of Cancer Medicine at Imperial College School of Medicine. I introduce Professor Carol Sikora. Really great to be here, difficult to be that. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of emotion flying around. Let me be the medic and just bring, her back, bring us back to facts. I can give you six reasons why lockdown is a bad idea. Uh, number one, why does it work? Wales goes into a two-week lockdown, the fire break. What's going to be different on the 9th of November when they all go back to work? Nothing. It can't be any different. Sure, the reproductive rate of the virus may drop a bit, but it'll, within two days, it'll be back to normal. So you've wasted billions of pounds in Wales to get to exactly the same position. And no one I've asked, even the fancy epidemiologists at Imperial, can't tell me uh, that I'm wrong. They say, yes, but you've reduced the pressure. But what for? The second thing, is the NHS really under pressure this time? It, last time, it had very good strategy to stop normal activity, and we'll come back to that in a moment, to allow people uh, to, to prepare the Nightingale hospitals. It was well, the, the, the peak day for admissions was the 8th of April, and by then, everything was coping well. What wasn't coping so well was the collateral damage to other healthcare problems. If you take today, there are certain parts where there's a very high incidence rate, and the hospitals are very busy. Hospitals are admitting, in the last 24 hours, 1,228 patients across the UK. But some places, like London, there's a handful of patients. Buckingham, where I live, um, and I'm on the trust board there, again, five patients in the hospital. So it's not flooding the system. So that takes me to the third point, which is the key diseases that you can't put on the shelf. We've heard them already cancer, heart attacks, and strokes. You just can't say, come back in three months. You've got to treat them there and then. Some with great urgency, heart attacks, need stenting, prevent later collapse of the muscle of the heart, long-term heart failure, and earlier death. Uh, and in the case of stroke, to dissolve the clot to avoid brain damage. So there's no doubt, and with cancer, which is my specialty, you really need to get on with it within a month at least. And today, Macmillan Fund launched their report showing that there are 50,000 undiagnosed cancers out there. How do they know that? They just look at the same sort of curve we look at daily for coronavirus, but you look at cancer and you can show that where are the missing 50,000 patients? The date today, uh, the end, nearly the very end of October, we'd expect 50,000 more people to have come through this year that haven't come through. Cancer is not like COVID. It doesn't go up and down winter and summer, uh, and not like influenza. It just doesn't change with the seasons. It's a plateau. It just keeps going. 1,000 new patients a day. That's what you expect. And we haven't seen that number yet. So we've got to do something for that. The fourth problem, mental health. We've heard about it. London Ambulance Service report shocking data. Suicidal ideation. Um, some of my colleagues talked to, I've never heard this before amongst oncologists, but talking about suicide quite openly over coffee. Uh, it's because it is so depressing out there. There's nothing to look forward to. You remove a future uh, joy, you get depression. And it's not just suicide, that's one extreme end, suicidal ideation being another, but much more commonly, low level depression. And imagine how bad it is for people that are poor, that live in substandard accommodation and are lonely. Depression really bites there. Lockdown doesn't improve mental health. We know it doesn't. The other thing, David Nabarro, who is going to be the, I hope, the Director General of the WHO, but sadly it is now the ambassador. It was given to someone else the job. But fantastic. Uh, quote where he says, poor people, the only thing lockdown does is make poor people poorer. And we've heard that already. It's inevitable. People on the bread line, people in the gig economy are not going to survive this if we go into some sort of complete lockdown with unending contract. They just can't do it. Um, I remember at the very beginning of this, wanting to go to Liverpool, 
and I got on the number 18 bus at Marylebone on the High Street on the on the main road, Eastern Road, and it was full of people. And it was clear they had to go to work. They were sitting on that bus with their tools uh, and so on, and they were going to work. And they they probably paid 10, 12 pounds an hour to do it, and, and they're doing it because they had to. Uh, it's all right for public sector workers. Um, they can stay at home. They're going to get a pension. Uh, and if people with middle class houses, that we've heard, you know, a nice lifestyle. Most of them in this room have a nice lifestyle. But if you're poor already and you're going to be very poorer, it's not great. And then finally, and Lord Sumption's talked about it already, the whole purpose of lockdown in the back of my mind is you're delaying, you're waiting for something, you're waiting for an exit. What's the exit? A vaccine. Is that really likely? I had the flu jab yesterday. I know it doesn't work, but you know it sort of half works. I, I may as well give my go to Tesco's and give myself the benefit of the doubt. But the reality is, there's so many billions of dollars riding. Six major big pharma companies are riding. Their chairmen are spouting stuff. Their chief executives are talking about it. We can't take the image that vaccines for all these types of viruses, SARS. Uh, the, the 2003 SARS, MERS, 2012 MERS, you know, the vaccines only work partially. They're not very effective. Collective immunity, to me, seems a better way out, just as Lord Sumption is, is saying. And I think, you know, for the sake of the patients I treat, cancer patients, we've got to get out of this quicker, long before a vaccine comes. Otherwise, more people are going to die. The other thing, the final thought I'd leave you with is if you look at the number of life years lost rather than the number of deaths from the disease, the average life year lost with COVID is, is relatively low because the people tend to be over 80 that die. The average death uh, in the UK was 82.4 over the last six months from COVID. Now that's the case. Now, obviously it's a distribution and there are some young people that do and that's inevitable in healthcare. But if you look at that 82.4, much left of normal life expectancy beyond 82.4. Sure, some of us will live to be 100, but most will die around that time any, anyway of something else. If you take cancer, you take heart attack, and you take strokes, the number of life years that you could save there is enormous. And looking at back of the envelope calculations, almost certainly there are over 100 life years to be saved for every COVID patient if you, call, if you treated cancer properly. And that, that's the calculation we need to do. Lockdowns go against it, not just because you shut down healthcare, but also you make people too scared to even pick up the phone to go to their GP and have a consultation. So they put up with chest pain, they put up with weight loss, with coughing up blood and so on, because they just don't want to go in a time of lockdown. Some of it's altruistic, they don't want to make the health service have problems. Some of it is just complete fear and they're locked in a vicious cycle of fear that won't allow them to get their bodies sorted out. So, you know, for living for tomorrow, what we've got to do now is persuade the government not to automatically pull down the, the, the lockdown strategy to try and contain the virus. It's not a good way forward as far as I can see. Thank you very much for the opportunity.